Praise the Lord. Good morning, IPC Hebron. Praise, the Lord. Praise be to God, the triune God, the one and only living God that is in our midst. Amen. We've been, we've been worshiping our God with the help of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Amen. Amen. We're going back to this portion, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We talked about the forerunners. We took about a few months to go over the forerunners. And we've been talking about the birth, and we're at the early life, and transitioning into the public ministry of Jesus. Today's message will combine a little bit of that, so please pay close attention. I'd like to start from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 22 to 38. Jesus, after he was born, he was presented at the temple... And it says that when the time had come for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what the law of the, law, law of the Lord said, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. So we are familiar with this portion. We see Jesus uh, is being presented at the temple, and there are two unique older people that are pointed out in the portion here. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and he was a righteous and devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him that the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So we see uh, an older man who was righteous and devout waiting uh, before his life was over to see something. He had a dream. And he came in the spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do to him according to the custom of the law. And he took him up in his arm and blessed according to your word God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light of revelation to the Gentiles for the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. For as a sign that is opposed, he will have to... Uh, go through many things, uh, and then verse, uh, it, it goes on to verse 36, where it talks about the prophetess Anna. We see another older person in the church, in the temple there, the daughter of Phinehuel, the, and the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in age. She had lived with her husband for seven years, and then afterwards the husband died. And uh, she was a widow and now is 84 years old. And she is in the temple. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and praying night and day. And coming up at this very hour, that the presentation of Jesus, she also came in giving thanks to God and to speak of him, all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So we see two particular people as we close up the early life of Jesus here. Simeon and Anna at the presentation of Jesus. Simeon means hearkening or that he, God has heard, that God had listened and God is hearing our prayer. That is the meaning of Simeon. The meaning of Anna means favor or grace. So if you take them together, these two older people that were spending their life mostly in the temple waiting for the redemption of Israel, redemption of mankind, he is saying, God has listened and heard us and has sent favor and grace in the form of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. What more uh, confirmation than you need, do you need? We talked about some of the Old Testament pro prophecies that came true in the life of Jesus, but now we have two eyewitnesses that had been prepared for a moment like this, that came in and said, we have found the favor and grace in the form of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, in your midst. The message for us is that 
There's a crucial role for the older people, as Pastor Georgie was just mentioning, about the past, the present, and the future. The past. There's a crucial role for the older people who have the courage to dream and tarry patiently in prayer until they see it happen. Amen? And receive the inner strength and are moved by the Holy Spirit. But I also have a message for the young people. If you think that your parents are too old-fashioned just because they're receiving the Holy Spirit and you think you're too good for that, I have a message that the Lord Jesus proved that wrong. The next story will go into the public ministry of the Lord Jesus. It started off in a particular fashion. We see the baptism in the Jordan River. We see the baptism in the Jordan River. And it shows us a window into the Trinity and triune God. That'll be our sermon title. I have a few portions, and I've asked to cut down the message a bit, so I'll go quickly. The baptism of Jesus is in all four of the Gospels. Uh, particularly, clearly, it is talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John talks about it uh, as well uh, when we get to it. Then Jesus came to Galilee and to uh, Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need it to be baptized by you. Why do you come to me? So John is like, no, this can't happen. This is not uh, going to happen. I need to be baptized by you. Why do you come to me? And Jesus answered and said, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. We see John obeying Jesus and and when Jesus said, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, and we'll go into that as we have time. We see that Jesus was baptized immediately, and he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens rent or opened before him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and coming to rest upon him. And behold, a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Amen. Amen. We see here the baptism of Jesus. We know that Jesus it was present from the beginning of time and that he is God. He, in the beginning he was a word and he was with God and he was God. He came into the earth taking on the lowly form of a human being and we learned about the birth of Jesus. We know that he had no sin so there was no need for him to be baptized under John because John was doing a baptism of the remission of sin for the people. So why would Jesus get baptized under John? Was it for any sin he had committed? No. He was sinless and perfect. But that's the question for us. Why did the Lord Jesus allow himself to be baptized under the hands of John the Baptist and said, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness and consent? We see that another key thing that we see here is after this particular baptism, when he obeyed and did the water baptism under John, we see a glimpse of the triune God coming together here. We see the Father God that says with a loud voice, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We see the Lord Jesus being obedient in the form of a man, the incarnate uh, Son, incarnate Christ, getting baptized, and he's looking up into heaven. And we see the Holy Spirit as well with the skies rent open, and we see the heaven come down in the form of a dove, and it comes upon the Lord Jesus and empowers him for further ministry. So this is the first thing that happens at uh, the public ministry of Jesus. Jesus, for about 30 years, was upon the earth living mostly in Nazareth as we studied. We know about the early life of Jesus, but then he goes into hiding, right? We don't hear much about the life of Jesus. And then he's coming back into the scene, into public ministry. And this is the first thing that we see, that John was baptizing people in the River Jordan. And Jesus comes as one of the people standing in line. And as he's baptizing others, he thinks nothing of it. But when Jesus comes to be baptized, he thinks that this is not something that should be done and John says, no, 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 I am not going to do this. But uh, the Lord told him, so that all righteousness might be fulfilled, please, uh, or 
baptize me. And we see John consented and Jesus was baptized under John. We can see this portion in Mark and also in Luke. Uh, we can see John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sin. And we see that uh, he says, after me comes one who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then in uh, Luke, we see that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the river Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on, upon him like a dove. And the voice that came from heaven that said, you are my beloved son with you, I am well pleased. So those portions are seen in all of these Gospels. Uh, we also see this in John as well, even though it doesn't necessarily talk about the baptism of Jesus. It says uh, that John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained upon him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this will be the one who baptizes you in the Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Amen. So we see that by the evidence, by being obedient and going through the water baptism experience under John, we see, that we, we see confirmation that Jesus is the Son of God and we see the Father testify with a loud voice and the Spirit coming down in the form, in the form of a dove and empowering him for further ministry. So the question that you might have is, why, again, did Jesus have to get baptized? Jesus was obeying the Father and setting an example for each one of us. Jesus was obeying the Father and setting an example. He was confirming the role of John the Baptist uh, someone else has talked about John the Baptist and how he was supposed to set the stage. And uh, uh, we see that the confirmation that John had heard from the Lord and the one that the dove would come down on upon and rest would be the Son of God. And that came to fruition in the life of Jesus. We see that it was revealing Jesus' identity as the Son of God uh, to Israel. See, Israel uh, was used to... Um, monotheism and again we have monotheism in the faith statement we have as a church but they were not used to the triune god and they uh they are ha having questions whether jesus is truly deity uh, they're questioning jesus's identity and and we see that the baptism with the father speaking out loud and the holy spirit coming upon him reveals jesus's identity as the Son of God. It's also the transition point and the public emergence back at age 30 onto the stage of the Lord Jesus and the beginning of his public ministry. You know that in order to have uh, ministry in public, uh, ministry uh, and mission work, you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, right? Even uh, Jesus, who was uh, fully man, uh, the incarnate Son of God, came into the earth and in order to go through what he had to go through for the next three, three and a half years, in order to go through and accomplish the will of the Father, in order to be, become the righteousness for our sake, in order to go through all of the suffering, he needed the power uh, endued from on high as well. How much more do we need it in our daily life? It was also showing a connection to humanity. It was a symbolic baptism pointing to the future three, three and a half years from now that he would endure the cross and uh, be risen again, that he would be baptized with that blood on the cross of Calvary. It was a symbolic baptism because in Jordan is all the sins of man and he dipped himself in the sin of man in that place and he was showing what he needed to go through uh, three, three and a half years later. And that is another thought, that he was showing how he would accomplish the redemption and how strong he needed to be for his public ministry for the next three and a half years to endure till the end the suffering he had to to accomplish the plan of God that he would die, he would be beaten, he would suffer for us. 
The next, uh, an important point that I would like to spend a few minutes on is the affirmation of the Trinity. This is one of the first places where you see uh, the appearance uh, of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as I attempt to teach on the Trinity, three in one, the triune God, three Egadevam, I am humbled and awed towards the incomprehensible complexity of God's nature. And I cannot say that I understand it, obviously. I'm the least uh, qualified to teach on this. But this is the next topic. The profound humility that I go into it with as I teach you all. Uh, the Trinitas is a Latin word that means triad or threefold. There is unity in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as three persons in one Godhead. There is a Greek word that means singleness of origin that portrays God as one. We serve a one God that is living and active. Amen? That is what our constitution in the High PC Hebron Church says as well. We serve one God uh, in three forms, uh, in, uh, three, three people, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as well. There are three co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial divine persons of the same substance and essence, but difference different in aspects and roles. That was an overview, but let me go through it uh, to the best of my ability. There is only one God. There is only one God, the true and living God. But the Father is a distinct person and also fully God. The Son is a distinct person, also fully God. The Holy Spirit is a distinct person and also fully God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons yet constitute this one name, the triune God. These three persons are distinct, yet share the same divine essence, and the Trinity reveals God's re relational nature and makes salvation possible. Amen. The example, there are many examples that people try to use to explain this, and uh, it, is, uh, it falls short in many ways. The closest one that I saw was the sun, S-U-N, the sun. We have never seen the sun literally, but we have felt the rays of the sun, and we know it as warmth, right? We know the light from the sun, and we have light day and night uh, because of it, right? So likewise, no one has seen the Father, the source, but we uh, have seen mankind, Jesus, Historically, Jesus uh, has come into the world 2,000 odd years ago and lived a perfect life for 33 and a half years and died on the cross. And that is an undeniable historic fact. We feel the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts and he empowers us, strengthens us for Christian living. So the sun analogy is the closest thing. Uh, it not only shows the distinctiveness and the inseparability but tells us about the role of each of them. And this analogy was given by Tertullian in 2000 AD. We see other examples of the triune God coming up in the baptism. We see the Lord Jesus giving the great commission to his disciples. And what did Jesus say? And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The one name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, pointing out that it is not names that is mentioned there. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. The baptism the Lord Jesus has established is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, we see the baptismal covenant where we see the triune God appear. In the benedictions that we normally hear at the end of church services, we also hear uh, Paul teaching us in 2 Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of, of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Again, we see the triune God uh, appear here. So it's important as Christians that we understand uh, the concept of Trinity. 
I hopefully did not confuse anyone, but uh, understand there is one living God with three persons, uh, and that is uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we can learn more about it in other opportunities as my time is running out. As I'm concluding, I want to say about the righteousness that was secured upon the cross. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, the Lord says, uh, By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteousness. The righteous one will cause many to be counted righteous. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. Based upon our works, we can never be righteous. And what Jesus accomplished on the cross is he secured righteousness for us. By his baptism, he was pointing to another baptism on the cross that was yet coming three and a half years later. And that was the way he opened his public ministry. So as we start this new topic on the public ministry of Jesus, and we cover the three and a half years, the way it was kicked off was by the baptism of the Lord Jesus under the hand of uh, John the Baptist. The worship team, come on up. Uh, the title uh, of our Savior might include Christ. He is Christ. He is Messiah. He is Emmanuel. He is Redeemer. But He is also our righteousness. God has listened to us and heard us, as I said, with Simeon and Anna, and sent favor and grace in the form of His Son, our Lord Jesus. And as those old people were seeking the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, waiting for this, we see a perfect son that was willing to be obedient. He knew the plan of the father as he was sent down, but he needed the help of the Holy Spirit at his baptism and the, and the confirmation of the father for the power that he needed to go and accomplish what could not have been accomplished by anybody. As you know, every human being born of Adam is born into original sin. But our Lord Jesus, who was born by a different seed, the seed of the Holy Spirit, was able to crush the head of the serpent. He came out of the womb of Mary, and he was able to crush the head of, our, of the serpent and became our righteousness for us. There is no righteousness of our own, but it is only by the blood of the Lamb. And he accomplished that. Glory be to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as we worship, as we go into a time of worship, I'm not sure how much we think about that when we worship. We say, glory to the Father. We say, thank you, Jesus. And we welcome the Holy Spirit. But we're to give glory and honor to all three components, all three persons of that one and living God, the Holy Spirit, as well as the Lord Jesus, as well as the Father. Let us serve the living God uh, faithfully because he is coming back once again. That cloud, that, that sky that was ripped open is going to be ripped open again. And it will not be a dove that comes down next time. It will be the Lord Jesus coming and saying, come up hither. And the, the ones that have accepted that righteousness, not of their own, but the righteousness of the blood of the Lamb. And are living it out daily by the help of the Holy Spirit will be taken up in the twinkling of an eye, and we will be with him forever and ever. May God bless you all with these words.